on cornerofthegalaxy.com. It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box, the show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Gessman, coming to you on a Monday, May 8th. LA Galaxy 3-1 losers to the Colorado Rapids. You know, we've only gotten to say that the LA Galaxy were winners once this entire year so far, uh, save for some preseason games. Feels like it's getting a little bit old. Kevin Cabral comes back with a vengeance. Uh, did relatively nothing on the night. Mostly Kevin Cabral things, but did get a goal out of it. And Colorado wins. We'll talk about all that fun stuff. Hot seat for Vanny. Hot seat for Klein. Hot seat for Beckerman. Hot seat for Anschutz. Hot seat for anybody who's ever been uh, uh, associated with the LA Galaxy. It feels that way. Uh, and 10 games through the season, the uh, LA Galaxy now getting ready for a U.S. Open Cup game against the Seattle Sounders coming up on Wednesday, so we'll get you ready for that as well. Uh, if you're looking for a positive one, you're not going to get it. Welcome back to the show, though. We're glad to have him, and he's on camera this time. Mr. Kevin Baxter. Kev, how you doing? All right. Hey, we're late because I'm an idiot. I mean, we would have been late every time, but, you know, this that you have to be more specific with everybody. <laughs> I'm an idiot who can't figure out tech. You, you know what's funny, though? I, I can't figure out that I'm, I'm way too old to figure out all this tech stuff that we, uh, that we do on this show that you try to guide me through but it was really funny we uh mrs pan and i were in sarasota last week and as we we're flying back on sunday on the plane she was trying to figure out the how the uh entertainment system on american airlines worked and she couldn't figure it out and she's way better than i am so she turned to the young young girl sitting next to her and said you look like you might be able to figure this out which is a way of saying you look young enough to know how computers work Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, listen, it happens. It happens to everybody trying to figure out all this stuff and trying to, to make sense of all of these things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know your 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 ability to uh, to fix tech is sort of the galaxy's ability to win games, um, well, you know, for, how forever. About Kevin Cabral, though? We would it, Kevin Cabral. I mean, when he came to the galaxy, the thing was he couldn't score. He finally scores at Dignity Health Sports Park, his first goal there since last July. Only his fourth ever in an MLS regular season game at Dignity Health Sports Park. What a time for him to come alive, huh? Yeah, he I, still I, plays for the Galaxy, right? I would like to remember everybody that uh, I would remind everybody that Kevin Cabral pulled a lot of Kevin Cabral things in this game as well. By the way, big shout out to Robin Frazier for being going. You are absolutely starting this game because Cabral hasn't started all the games. Uh, no. he's been mixed and matched and he's come off the bench and he's done some different things. And Robin Frazier's like, Oh yeah, I bet as soon as the, uh, their game was done, uh, from the previous week and he went to Kevin, Cabral, you're starting against galaxy. Like it's one of those here, here's your chance for revenge, Kevin. Here's your chance for, you get to do it. You get to celebrate in front of the fans. You get to show them who you are. So we're definitely starting you. And Cabral did basically everything Cabral normally does, which is get to about the final ball and then miss the finish because he did that a couple times in this game. And the only thing I'll say is the goal that he scored, Kevin, you, Kevin Baxter, could have scored said Kevin Cabral's goal. You you might have had you might have had to stand offside for ninety percent of the, the 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 play in order to be in that position. But if you did that, you would have scored that goal. If you want to see a beautiful goal, by the way, go look at Alyssa Thompson's goal uh, for Angel City yesterday. Oh my God, she's only eighteen. What an incredible goal! But. Interesting you, you bring up Robin Frazier because I wanted to talk about managers. The Galaxy now are tied for last place in Sporters Shield, tied for the wooden spoon. Actually, they're, they're Sporting Kansas City right now is behind the Galaxy, leading the wooden spoon race on goal differential. But nobody has fewer wins than the Galaxy. Nobody has fewer points than the Galaxy. 
Um, they're third from the bottom in goals. Um, and their goal differential is second worst against only sporting Kansas City uh, is, you know, has a worse goal differential. But you mentioned Robin Fraser, and I wanted to talk about managers. Two managers fired today, Chicago yes. and the Red Bulls, both fired their managers. And as we just mentioned with this record, those teams had better records than the Galaxy. Yeah. So where does that leave Greg Vanny? Well, Greg Vanny uh, and, uh, of course, Peter Vermees at, at SKC. Now, they beat Seattle over the weekend, which if you were hoping the LA Galaxy were going to surprise Seattle and get one of those surprise wins, um, I think this one, I think that sort of goes uh, goes out the window a little bit with that. Uh, we'll talk about the Open Cup game coming up on Wednesday night. But no, I mean, the bottom line is that if you're looking at, uh, you know, certainly New York and, and what has been happening, they've sort of been having these fluctuating results. I certainly think the the and they said it played no part in it whatsoever. And everybody said, yeah, but obviously the the racial slur that was abused and how how the New York Red Bulls uh, uh, manager handled that in that particular situation definitely played into to that. I mean, Ezra Hendri he Ezra over at Chicago Fire was supposed to turn that thing around. He got sort of a grace year last year, and this was supposed to be sort of, I guess, the year that was everything was brilliant. No. Um, Taylor Twelman came out and said, if you think that, that, that Ezra is the problem at Chicago Fire, you haven't been paying attention. Chicago very much sort of in the vein of the galaxy, which is going through coaches, going through GMs, going through all the things that they've sort of going done. through stadiums. Yeah, going through stadiums. That's something the galaxy haven't tried yet. Maybe they, maybe they'll kick themselves out of their own uh, own stadium for a little bit. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things you said. What does it mean for Greg Vanny? What does it mean for Chris Klein? Really, because the bottom line here is that Chris Klein gets to make the decision, according to Dan Beckerman um, and the LA Galaxy and how they've set up their hierarchy. Uh, Chris Klein gets to make the decision on on Greg Vanny. So Chris Klein has to decide whether or not he has enough capital in the bank in order to survive another manager. I'll tell you right now, he doesn't. So if, if you want Vanny out, then you're going to have to ask Klein to move out of the way first. That's my belief. What? Well we didn't get a chance to do any show prep because we were working on my IT problems unsuccessfully as it turned out. But one of the things we were, you know, I, I'm sure we we're going to talk about is where we we're going to bring up this manager thing. And it looks like we're going to do it at the start. Um, as we talked about last week, if you remember last week, I laid out the, the pros and cons for it is should Vanny be replaced and should he not be. And one of the, the conclusions was he shouldn't be replaced because there's nobody out there that's better than him. Um, if, all of a sudden, Greg Berhalter becomes available. I think that that would be somebody that would fit nicely into the Galaxy. He's He has a Galaxy pedigree. He played here. He got his coaching start under Bruce Arena with the Galaxy. I, I don't think Greg Vanny, I, I don't think they should pull the plug on the uh, on the Vanny experiment just yet because I think they did that too early with Kurt Anafo. I think Vanny had laid out a plan, but but things are beginning to go south. And I think you made the best point. If they, if they were to fire Vanny now, which again, I'm arguing against, but if they were to do that, if that was a plausible, a plausible option, Chris Klein, it, you can't have Chris Klein taking the heat that he's taking, be the guy to fire the coach, because then two things happen. One, Klein again uses the coach as a scapegoat. Remember, we've been through five coaches now since Bruce Arena left. So Klein is going to say, I'm firing the coach. That should fix everything when we know that that's not the case. Right. And then the other part, what whoever Klein puts in as a replacement if the team doesn't go far in the playoffs, Chris Klein said he would step aside. That means this coach then becomes something of a lame duck. The last Chris Klein coach, um, how much support is he going to have from the fan base? How much support is he going to have in the front office? Um, is this a decision that, then that Dan Beckerman needs to take out of Chris Klein's hands? Chris Klein is the only guy above Danny in Carson. Beckerman, the CEO of, of AEG, could make that decision. But I don't know that that the fans have much faith in, in Dan Beckerman. He's the guy who signed Chris Klein to multi-year contracts on two occasions. So is that the guy you want making this decision? I think the whole, the whole dysfunction in the front office and in management uh, it makes it impossible at this point to fire Vanny. That's kind of my opinion because Klein and Beckerman would then have their fingerprints on the firing and on the, uh, the hiring of the new coach. Yeah, and ultimately, I think the the dysfunction that we've talked about, certainly uh, within Chris Klein and then then uh, above that with AEG and their inability to really react to the problems of the LA Galaxy. Now, AEG, in their defense, has spent a lot of money, but they haven't solved the leadership problem at the top, right? And ultimately, without solving that problem at the top, they have allowed all of these problems to fester and continue and to grow and basically to sanction the missteps and missed, missed 
uh, connections and mistransfers and the buyouts and all the things that they've sort of done. AEG has sat by and sanctioned all these without having any sort of grasp over really the, the, the team that is underneath their brand, that they own, that Phil Anschutz owns under AEG. Um, and so they've allowed it to get diseased and fester and be this problem. Um, so unless you're going to clear everything out, uh, unless AEG is willing to sell the team to, you know, Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler likes the LA Galaxy. He always wears that shirt. Why, not? Why shouldn't it be Adam Sandler? Uh, unless AEG is ready to sell the team to somebody who wants to take care of it in a manner that it probably deserves. And remember, when Tim Laiwiki was in charge of AEG, he was intimately involved with the LA Galaxy on a regular basis. And I think we've seen something different from Dan Beckerman, which is he says he hires the people to put in places to do those jobs. Very much a, a large company sort of outlook, right? Tim Laiwiki is sort of like, tell me what you guys are doing and let me see how I can help you or how I can help you fix it. Or why aren't we doing this? Right. Dan Beckerman is I hired you. So you go do your job again. That works as long as you hire the right people. The well, adjustment hasn't been that. That's the adjustment that hasn't been made is you keep investing in a team. And I mean, the front office team that has shown that they are not capable of fixing the problem. Well, you mentioned Tim Laiwiki. Um, it I had a chance to talk to Tim Laiwiki at length um, a couple of years ago when I did uh, like an anniversary of Beckham's coming to the to the galaxy. Um, uh, um, and he talked through those years when he was in charge of AEG and he talked about, it, it was clear that he had an idea. He had an idea of what he wanted to build. He had an idea for the culture. He said when they hired, when they brought Beckham over, that wasn't ever supposed to be the final move. Beckham was a midfielder. He wasn't going to make the team, uh, uh, you know, more potent offensively, even though he was playing with Landon Donovan, there was always a second move and that was Robbie Keane. And the, the, the thinking that like Wiki knew that this was going to be a process, he was going to put things together. It wasn't one move to fix things. I, I thought it was real illuminating when you look at the way things are going now. Um, and Tim Laiwiki was a winner. He went after he got fired at AEG, he went to, to uh, Tor Toronto and helped set that franchise up. And they went on under Greg Vanny to win a, a, a triple, uh, you know, win the treble, the only MLS team to win the treble. Then he goes to Seattle, starts a hockey team. They upset Las Vegas in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, the Kraken are now continuing the Stanley Cup playoffs. So Tim Laiwiki was good at formulating a strategy and a culture and a plan. Um, we, You were there when, when Dan Beckerman came up to me. It was during one of the COVID games where he came over to me and laid out what you just said. Um, I had said something about him needing to hire a new coach or a new general manager. I forget what the, 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 the controversy of the day was, but he came over and kind of lit me up and said, I don't make those decisions. Those decisions are made by the people below me is exactly what you said. And at right. that point it was Dennis to close Dennis to close. will make all the, all those decisions. That was right, right, right before GBS got fired, I believe is, is when that all took place. My point is that the buck has to stop somewhere. I mean, if, if, Chris Klein and Dennis DeClosa or Greg Vanny are saying, well, you know, Dan Beckerman wants to do this. And then Dan Beckerman says, I really have no input. It's up to those guys. Where does the buck stop? And I think that's part of the problem. We don't know who really is to blame yeah. for all these things. But one thing that was really interesting, I thought the post-game press conference after the loss to Colorado was one of the best because there was a lot of things said in that post-game press conference, mainly by Greg Vanny and, and Chicharito. I found really interesting. One of the things Greg Vanny what talked about is, is his quotes. He said, talking about the way they played and, and how the game sort of got away from them. He said, we became very chaotic. We were kind of all over the place. He said, um, we need to open the game more. We've got to stop forcing the game uh, down the middle of the field. Um, these are things that a coach is supposed to address. I mean, he's talking about we're chaotic. We were kind of out of control. We we're all over the place. Isn't he the coach? Isn't he supposed to change that? And then he said, we need to simplify some things, but because of uh, of Costa not being available and they having to use Tyler Board on the wing, they changed formations. And that was one of the things Brugman talked about. The formation change kind of threw the team for a loop. They really they played that diamond in the midfield, and they weren't really sure what was going on. On one hand, Greg's saying we need to simplify things. On another, on the other hand, he's introducing a new formation, and the players are saying, "Yeah, we weren't comfortable with that." Can can, can we go to that though? You, you're playing a four four two diamond, one of the most base base packages. Like you're talking base offense defense. Four four two diamond is. Easy to play. Everybody has a defined role. I guaranteed Ricky Pooj and Gaston Brugman, because Gaston even said so. He goes, you know, we didn't have a lot of time to train in it. And the whole deal, but he goes, but everybody's played that before, right? That's the type. 
everybody knows what that is. This is not, Greg Vanny does not have to teach fundamentals to a professional soccer team. That's not what he's trying to do. What he's trying to do is teach a system within other things, right? So when we say that, oh, they weren't comfortable in the 4-4-2 diamond, there's zero reasons they should have not been comfortable in the 4-4-2 diamond. Basically, all their responsibilities were there. Ur Uri Rossell was sitting in a defensive midfielder role that was able to free up guys like Ricky Pouge, like Gaston Brugman to be able, like Delgado. There's really almost no change in their assignments or what they're trying to do in those cases. E even when they're playing in the 3-5-2, which now Greg Vanny, I guarantee you Greg Vanny is done with the 3-5-2. That that was pretty evident in the in the in the press conference as well. But even they know how to play in this stuff. I think he was more on the head, Kevin, whenever he said that they were trying to be and, and people don't like this because it almost assumes that you can it, it assumes. And I think most fans assume that you can't try too hard, that there's no such thing as overplaying. Right. We, we can talk about baseball. Uh, when a pitcher is trying to throw really hard, we say he's overthrowing the throwing the ball, right? Like you're 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 trying so hard that you're losing control with what you're trying to do, and the control is more important than the velocity, right? That's we we can sort of say, oh, he, you know, he's overthrowing his pitches. You know, that's really the problem. He just needs to you know be in that. Set. The Galaxy are overthrowing their pitches. They are so geeked out. Watch them in the first five minutes about how just gung-ho, straightforward, I'm going to kill everybody, I'm going to tackle everybody, I'm going to get to every ball, I'm going to win every duel, I'm going to do everything. Watch how geeked out they are in those first 10 minutes. Um, Sophie was sitting next to me on my left-hand side in the press box, and Alex Ruiz was sitting next to me on the right-hand side, and we were talking about how the players are letting Vanny down in a lot of ways right now. Um, and this, to me, is the ba is the basis of that. There's zero issues with a diamond. There's zero issues with a two-man forward that Chicharito and Jovalich shouldn't be able to figure out by now. Um, Chicharito basically in tears, Kevin, in the in that post-game press conference. Well, he, and he said some things too. He said something needs to change, and he talked about needs to change on the training field, needs to change in the games. But the the best quote for me was he said. It, he suggested he didn't say this. This is my interpretation. There's really been no accountability uh, on the other players in the team. He said, talking at the press conference, which Chicharito comes to almost after every game, oh. he said that more people need to come here and face the thing, face the things, meaning us. We're the same people speaking always. That's where when you talk about the dressing room, and we talked about it ad nauseum last year, the important guys in the dressing room who may not play every week but but hold the team together. This year, there's no there's no Sasha Kleshton. There's no Victor Vasquez to do that. Chicharito's kind of left hanging. Um, there, there's three designated players. I don't think Ricky Pooja has come to a post-game press conference to explain things this year. Uh, Douglas Costa never will. Um, it's Chicharito. And, and Brugman comes. But there's no guy like Sasha that's going to stand up and – and, and tell things the way it is. And Chicharito made it, made it clear that he's tired of having to be that guy that provides the answer. Not that he doesn't want to. He was really good and really honest. But it's like he doesn't. He feels like there should be some other people standing up and, and being accountable as well. And, and I don't know that we're seeing that. He was calling out reporters, by the way. I tried to tell all the reporters that, and they all looked at me like I was crazy. The, the same guys, whenever he said it, go watch the way he says it. You know, the same guys are talking every time. Well, Chicha, one, you're the captain. You get to talk every time. If we were in the locker room, we would ask for you every single time, and you would come talk to us every single time, and that's how it works. Most guys are getting let off the hook because we're not in the locker room anymore, quite honestly, and we only get to request like three players because that's a reasonable amount of time to get through three players. Um, but he's calling us out in the press saying that we're not asking enough questions of, of people. And, and I sit there and say, you know, that, hey, worry about your own place. We'll, we'll handle our stuff. By the way, Gaston Brugman spoke basically for the first time this year after a game. Um, so that way we could talk to him. Um, the other part about that, Chicha can be frustrated. And I think he's certainly at the point where he thinks he's playing up to a certain level that he expects himself to play from, and he's not seeing it from the rest of everybody else. Uh, and he doesn't necessarily see eye to eye with Greg on some of that stuff too, either. If you read what Greg says, you sort of read what Chicha says and, and try to, you know, put those two things together. I think that they're, they're not the same. 
right? And so I think that Chicha thinks the effort's not there. Greg thinks the effort's there. In fact, he thinks the effort is is too much almost in, in some states. It's the chaotic reasons for for a lot of things. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is the LA Galaxy were way more dangerous whenever they were able to get Tyler Boyd on the field. Uh, Greg Vanny told us afterwards that Tyler Boyd was questionable for the game. Uh, didn't know whether or not he was going to play. Um, and so whenever they went down and they knew that they were going to need some whip and they were going to need to be able to do something, then they went and they pulled out the uh, Tyler Boyd. And and I agree. In the diamond, it absolutely is a a very non-width looking, you know, uh, uh, formation, right? You're not going to get the width. You're not going to get the crosses. So the Galaxy look very pedestrian in that first half because they aren't getting the whip. They aren't getting the crosses. Tyler Boyd comes in at halftime. He led the LA Galaxy in chances in 45 minutes. He had four chances. Um, and so, you know, it's the same thing we've been talking about over and over again, which is the LA Galaxy don't have wingers. Uh, Douglas Costa isn't a winger. Tyler Boyd is the only winger they have. Um, and when he's not available, then you have to do something else. If you go to the the three five two, you can put wing backs in, play with three center backs. That's a better look. I also don't think I think Greg Vanny's done with the two forward system, and he basically said as much. Um, he says I don't think we're comfortable in some, in these two forward sets. I don't. I think we're losing too much on the defensive side. Um, and that he's I, I in my mind he's telling everybody he's telegraphing. He's telling you right now four two three one. That's what it's going to be. We're going back to our base. And the base for him has always been that four two three one, um, or four three three a little bit more. But again, without the wingers, and this is a galaxy problem. This is a Greg Vanny problem. This is a um, you know now unfortunately for Will Koontz, it's a Will Koontz problem. Uh, it's an AEG problem. It's a Chris Klein problem. They had a chance to buy Douglas Cost out. They didn't do it. All right, so they can't complain that they couldn't get any wingers. They also waited too long to get any wingers. So all those things have led to the fact that they do not have wingers to play. Tyler Boyd is it. That's it. That's the only guy they got. And we heard that there was another other moves coming, other moves coming. Yeah, we Galaxy Vanny did a great job and got a couple outside backs, but he, he didn't get the wingers you're talking about. Now he's complaining about there's no wingers. He traded Kevin Corral. He had to pay that fine um, uh, over the Pavone signing. I understand that. Kevin Cabral probably was never going to succeed here. That was a good move. When Grant Sear didn't come back, I think that kind of messed everything up. And the Calvary is not going to ride to the rescue this summer like last year because the Galaxy can't sign anybody during the summer transfer window. So unless they're able to make a deal in MLS, this is it. Yeah. They've got to go forward and try to figure out a way to make these players play. The interesting thing about Saturday's game is it, it was f fairly one-sided, certainly on the scoreboard. But when you look at the stats, the Galaxy dominated p possession. They outshot Colorado 21 to 10. Yep. They had more shots on goal. Yep. Um, they just, you know, and, and even Ricky Pooch, who didn't look like he had an outstanding game, had five shots. Yep. It's just the Galaxy or every shot the Galaxy took seemed to go right to Yarborough. Well, that and they also, again, take low percentage shots. I mean, we can basically see. Look at the 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 XG for the LA Galaxy in Colorado. Colorado scored three goals and had an XG of 1.1. The Galaxy scored one goal, had an XG of 2.2. But go look at Colorado's chances. Big chances, those two goals in the second half and then the first half. Bottom line, they gave the ball away. It, le it led to a corner kick. Um, you know, Jonathan Klinsman, who did not drape himself in glory this game, uh, came out, tried to get to the ball, and completely missed it. You want to talk about mistakes that can't happen? That's one of those mistakes that can't happen. Um, you know, I, I think Klinsman is is better in some ways than than Jonathan Bond, and I think Jonathan Bond is better than Klinsman in some ways, and I think all those are very minuscule, tiny little things. The Galaxy, I think, are going to be welcome to have Jonathan Bond back, which I, I think Klinsman is better at distribution. Um, I do think Jonathan Bond is a little bit more physical and able to handle balls better in the box. Those are my my initial thoughts on that. But the reason the LA Galaxy gave up the first goal, and by the way, Kevin, only twice in 10 games have the LA Galaxy scored the first goal. And in one of those games, they lost that game three to one. All right. So only the Austin game did the LA Galaxy score first and end up getting a win. And by the way, only win of the season as well. Right. And they had a long scoreless streak that was snapped when that judge goal. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, talk about the consolation of consolation goals. And by the way, you ever want to see an XG that's super high, that's not a penalty kick. Look at the the, the Judd goal. Uh, his first in MLS. So good for him. Gito VV got his first 10 minutes in Major League Soccer. So he made his LA Galaxy and MLS, MLS debut. I guess that's some consolation. The LA Galaxy were trying to play it up on marketing emails that were going out. It was like, oh, Preston Judd scored his first goal and Gino VV got 10 minutes. That, that's sort of the highlights from that game. 
uh, from the most wow. part. Remember, it used to be Robbie Keane won MVP and Landon Donovan's going to the national team. That was the stuff they used to send out. Now we get uh, Preston Judge's first goal. We go through the through our passing chart, and again, so narrow, so very narrow, and it doesn't really improve until Tyler Boyd was able to come into that game and, and, and sort of do things uh, to open up the width in that. Um, you know, Scott French po- pointed out in the... Uh, in the press box that he thought that Ronan from Colorado had the best game, fought Mabu would agree at 8.6, had a very good game. Uh, Kevin Cabral at 8.2. He scored a goal. That really saves a lot of his stuff. He got a yellow card. He ran into Chicharito a couple times. He flopped once or twice as well. Um, and then he scored. Listen, very good for accounting of him, but also remember that Kevin Cabral scored six times for the LA Galaxy as well. So it's not like it never happens. Uh, Colorado's seeing a lot of that. Uh, as, as well in that. So listen, I think Colorado had a good game. I think the Galaxy had a bad game. Uh, but the the attrition that we're starting to see in terms of injuries, Kevin, the attrition we're starting to see in terms of um, just the the in, the unavailability of all players on a continuous and continuing basis, uh, it's start it's killing the LA Galaxy. Uh, with not being able to start Tyler Boyd in this game, killed the LA Galaxy. Uh, the, the most important person in the entire, well, the, let's put it, the second most important person on this LA Galaxy team is Tyler Boyd. The first most important is Ricky Pooj, because they can't get the ball to Tyler Boyd if Ricky Pooj isn't playing, right? So Ricky Pooj, Tyler Boyd, probably the two most important players on this team. And Tyler Boyd is, I think he's going to be a solid player, but I don't know that he's going to be a game-changing player. Um, and they need somebody on the other wing in, in any case. Uh, you know, if the, the Galaxy become... Uh, you know, heavily skewed to whatever side Tyler Boyd's on, that's going to be pretty easy to defend. I, I really think there, and you talk about the injuries and, and you know, some of the injuries, I would argue, you know, maybe Douglas Costa's injury, maybe if this was a World Cup final, you might see him out there playing. I, I don't know how serious these injuries are. I'm not the trainer. But I do think Chicharito was hinting at something when he talked about other people need to step up and come and, 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 and talk to us and be accountable. I, I just wonder if, if, it, things are starting to go a little bit awry in that locker room because there isn't a Sasha question. There isn't a Victor Va- Vasquez. Um, you know, there are some leaders in there. I think De- Delgado could be one. I, I definitely think Chicharito is. And the fact that he came and sort of voiced his displeasure. Right. Um, right. Hints at a bigger problem for me. Now, the 2017 team was the wooden spoon team. Yes. Do you think that this team has reached rock bottom yet? Well, there's. I think you have to discuss three teams whenever you talk about rock bottom. Uh, 2017, where they won the wooden spoon. Now, um, they were they were not a good team, right? And we remember that year. That was not a good team. That was a that was a fire dumpster fire from the very beginning. Similar in terms of of what was happening. But by the way, this team is worse than that team through the first ten games. Well, that's what I was going to get to. That, that team finished eight, eighteen, and eight. Yeah. If you look at the projected, uh, and they had forty five goals gave up 67 goals and, and had 0.94 points per game. Okay. Right. That was 2017, which by all accounts is the worst team in galaxy history. Mm-hmm. This, the projection for this team, and it's early, it's only 10 games in the projection is this team will win less than four games. will lose about 21, 22 games. Um, this team will score about 30 goals. So 15 less than 2017. It'll give up about 60 goals, pretty close to, yeah. to that. Um, for them to get to the playoffs, um, we're talking about the playoffs. The For them player. to get to the playoffs, they we talked about before, the average uh, over the last four full seasons is 42 points to finish ninth, and that would get them in the Dan, in the Don Garber play-in game. To do that, they need to get uh, 1.5 points a game from here on out. Only once since Bruce Arena left has the Galaxy done that. And by the way, they, uh, they got 1.5 points per game or better every full season that Bruce Arena was here. And they've done it once since then. They have to average that over the, the final uh, stretch here o- over the rest of the season in order to get to what we think would be ninth place and a and playoff position. That looks to me to be pretty tough. I mean, I was actually pretty optimistic a couple of games ago, right. but that looks like a pretty difficult hill to climb at this point. Let me get to some Super Chats because they've been stacking up. Uh, Raphael, $5 Super Chat. A haiku by resident poet Uncle Dishwasher, who's one of my favorites. Uh, LA Galaxy, a never-ending winter. Kevin Cabral scores. I like that. That's nice. That is, that's poetic. Another one for Raphael, $5 Super Chat. Why does the galaxy hurt me every week? Thanks for the weekly group therapy time, guys. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a lot of punishment right now for an, and not a lot of reward. Um, 
I it's sort of like I take a shower to come to these games. It's like, you know, I get dressed and put on like pants to come to these games. Like so, pretty soon it's going to be like you get like everybody's just going to I'm just going to watch these games from home. Even if you were going to the same going, you know what? It's if they're going to lose, I'll just watch them from home. That's well, you, you know what? It reminds me of the railroad. Your railroad. I mean, yes. the, the galaxy are going nowhere. I mean, they're just going in circles, right? They come come back to start. By the way, the 2017 team was three, five and two after uh, 10 games. Now they're one, six and three. Yeah. So 20, 2017. Well, I, again, I said 2017 is one of the teams. 2020. 2020 was actually a worst year. It was abbreviated, so it didn't end up being the worst year. And there was a worst team in uh, the Western Conference, I believe, that year, and overall in the in the uh, in the standing, so they didn't win the wooden spoon. But 2020 was a worse year than 2017 was. 2020 had 15 points at this point, so nine points better than the LA Galaxy are right now. Um, here's the thing, though: if the LA Galaxy won the wooden spoon, and listen, they're basically tied uh, with Sporting Kansas City for the bottom. I think it's uh, one points per game. It's because there's a game in hand by the LA Galaxy and the points per game, right. and they probably goal and the, differential. And the goal differential yeah. is different. Yeah, so they had the, you know, Sporting Kansas City has the worst one. But if the LA Galaxy won the wooden spoon this season with this team, it would be a worse accomplishment than winning the gold wooden spoon with the 2017 team because the talent disparities between that 2017 team and this 2023 team's are gigantic in my opinion. Um, this is a twenty-five, twenty-seven million dollar payroll team. I mean, listen, they they certainly scaled back a little bit in that twenty seventeen. They still spent a lot of money, by the way. I think that's one of those things where we go back and look at it and go, you know, they actually still spent a lot of money, even though they didn't get a lot of quality players and they tried to do a bunch of things that didn't work out. Um, but if this team won a wooden spoon, right, a travesty. I mean, listen, everybody's getting fired if this continues going down. I mean, I'll get fired. You'll get fired. Uh, you know, they're just going to wipe the slate clean. It's going to be like, a, you know, one one day, just burn everything down. Um, I, I don't know. I, it's really hard. I know where they go from here. They go and play the U.S. Open Cup game that's on Wednesday night that we'll talk about. I know where they... I, I know where they think that they can be and, and where I think they can be. And I think they can be a good team, which is crazy to think after one win in 10 games. Um, but but they almost have me speechless because I don't understand why they're not capable of putting it together. I mean, Kevin, even if you got these guys, 11 guys in a pickup game and told them to go out there and play, you would think that they would have to have to certainly find some answers um, you know, like, Hey, you guys, you're in a pickup game. Just go out there and play and have some fun. Even if you did that, I have to imagine that they win some games. Um, so them not winning games, not being able to even be really competitive against Colorado, uh, second half, they were more competitive, but also we've seen this a lot from the LA galaxy. It's rinse and repeat, go down a goal, throw everything forward, get beat on the counter. Uh, people want to blame the defense for that. It, it's, it's not a matter so much of the defensive set as it is the offensive set and what the LA galaxy are tasked with when they go down a goal. What are you going to lose by more goals? And that's worse. Like, you know, sometimes, yes, depending on when you give up the goal. But if you're in an advanced position, if you're taking a chance to try to get forward, then you know you're opening yourself to a counterattack. Um, and Colorado was good with counter. It's on turnovers and transitions. Greg Vanny's favorite thing, turnovers and transitions. And they didn't handle it. You know, starting, I'll, I'll be honest, the big mistake I had was starting Sega Koulibaly instead of uh, Jalen Neal. Now, I think there's a good reason for it. Uh, Jalen Neal, this is his first year in major league soccer. He's basically played almost all the minutes. Um, this is a kid who is not used to playing 34 games at this level. He's going to have to either adjust to that and be able to have the stamina to be able to make it through that, or he's going to plateau and you're going to start to see mistakes happen. Um, and so I think Vanny was trying. He told him, we asked him, uh, I specifically, I asked him about why he started Sega instead of Jalen and the whole deal. And he said, you know, I'm trying to get another center back going. He goes, Chris Mavinga was supposed to be that guy. Mavinga was supposed to be that guy. Uh, and he's, he's out. Hurt he gets yeah. hurt. He goes, so I needed another center back because we have a lot of games coming up and I want to be able to rotate guys and be able to get through this. You know, Kostaris back there and 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 Sega and Mavinga and Jalen Neal are sort of your guys. And there should have been a rotation. Yeah. Well, Zavaleta's there too. Um, but Clearly, Sega above Zavaleta in terms of it. So Sega goes out now. He gets hurt. Vanny said to me after that game, uh, he basically said, I'm not sure that's a quick return, right? So he didn't know what the injury was, but I don't think he felt real optimistic about it. So you don't start Jalen Neal. You're not able to start Tyler Boyd. Douglas Costa is hurt. 
Um, you know, you're getting into the, you, you don't, F. Ryan Alvarez has been MIA, just completely gone this year. I remember this was his season. Remember he even got the number seven shirt from Robbie Keane, right? That was the whole deal. This was his season. In, in his preseason, he had the personal trainer. He had the dietitian. He looked good. He played well in the preseason. I think a lot of us were really high on, on that this was fine. I mean, how many times we've said that, that this is going to be F, F. Ryan's year. And once again, it turns out to be, no, it's going to be another disappointing year. It's like the mirage. It keeps showing up and then there's no there there. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I should mention Raheem Edwards not on the team sheet. I believe he was injured as well because uh, somebody said, hey, start Edwards. He wasn't even on the team sheet. He wasn't there. We believe he was injured. Didn't get a chance to ask when there's so much carnage on the field. You usually have to ask other questions. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, 892 says, I'm not sure what can change in the near future, but would there be a case that MLS would have an interest in the galaxy making some changes? Remember they put together, there's like this commission that's supposed to help teams. MLS put together a commission that's supposed to help teams that aren't competing. Um, so does MLS go in there and say, Hey, Greg Vanny. Hey, Chris Klein. Hey, Will Koontz. Hey guys, how's it going? We're here to help. Let us help you. We're going to help. You know what? You're the Galaxy. I know that you've won five MLS Cups. I know that you're technically one of the most successful teams historically in the league, but it seems that you have lost your way, and Don Garber is here to show you the light. Um, I think that would be really interesting to see. Uh, well, I mean, when you think about the, the fact that Phil Anschutz saved MLS in 2001 when he bought all those teams and, 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 and paid the money to keep the league alive, how ironic it would be if the league had them to come in and save Phil Anschutz's last team. Um, that would be such an embarrassment if, if that was even talked about, that a team like the Galaxy uh, would need that kind of help. But, but I mean, wh where do you go? I, I just – a couple of weeks ago, as I said, I, I was fairly optimistic. I thought this team was, was too good to be this bad. Now I don't know. As you mentioned, the injuries, I think the, 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 the dressing room is, is in a really poor sh shape. Greg Vanny seems to be flailing, and I don't know if it's the injuries or whether he's run out of ideas. Why, why, do, you guys are not why do you think he's that? why do you think he's flailing? To me, he gives a pretty pretty honest assessment of where the club is at and what happens in the game. Do you think he doesn't? He's like, we're going back. He goes, I tried no. to do different things. I tried to mix it up. I there was a hint. We got told that there was a hint that the players were not happy because they wanted to play in a two man forward set. Right? We had we had right. heard that, um, and so he put them in the two forward set. And no offense, but they didn't exactly, you know, make a glowing review of it. There was a couple good games where they had it. it. It does seem to me that this game, and maybe there's overreaction to it because it is more of an outlier than it is the norm. The result is the norm, but the way they played is an outlier. Um, but, I mean, I, I I think he's flailing because he's saying things like we're chaotic. We were kind of all over the place. He, he, another quote, he said, it just became a jumbled mess. He's the coach. Yeah. He's the coach. If it's chaotic, if it's a jumbled mess, fix it. You and I can say that from the press box because we don't have it. We're not able to right. fix it. We don't have the ability to fix right. it. If you're the coach and you're seeing those things, right. then fix them. And I just, if he, he seems to be saying the same thing, it gets more and more dire each week, but it's basically the same message. You know, it, it's almost like they're not listening to me. They're not doing what I tell them. Right. Well, that's not. That's yeah. not a good thing. But but soccer, more than almost any other sport, is very much one in which the manager can only influence in very small ways. And if you think that your manager is able to go out there and fix 11 guys who've decided they're all going to make the play, they're all going to be the guy, then I ha then I'm gonna, you're going to go through a lot of coaches that way. But, 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 so what's the problem? Is it the guys don't listen to him? Is he's asking them to do things they are not able to do? Is it the players are freelancing? Did they tune him out? Is the, strat is the strategy that he wants them to play? I think that's a good point. They're incapable of playing? I think that's a really good point. I think that's, that's, a, that's a very, I mean, listen, you don't get things right a lot, but this is one I think that, that you're right on. That yeah, what 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 is what is the answer? I mean, the answer then is if any of those things are true, right? Then they're, well, they're not listening to you, Greg. So either you need to figure out a way for them to listen to you, or you need to be able to break this down. We know Vanny runs a complex offense, right? We know that he's one of those guys who builds into years of sort of running the same offense. That way, you can figure out it's all space based. Um, it is more quote unquote total football than 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 a lot of coaches sort of play. I mean, it's certainly more than what Robin Frazier does. And and listen, that's not a knock on Robin Frazier. Robert Frazier gets a lot out of guys who aren't necessarily the best in the land, right? Um, so so yeah, I mean, 
I, I don't I don't have a good answer for you, but the bottom line is that he Vanny needs to fi- excuse me Vanny needs to figure out how to package what he wants them to do in a way that they can do it and they can accomplish and, it. And that's where Vanny being in the hot seat is true or not true. If if management determines that Greg Vanny that the team is no longer listening to Greg Vanny that he cannot implement his style with the team and style of play because they're not listening to him that the players have tuned him out. That's a bad thing. And and that's where I think you have to step in and you have to make a coaching change because he may be the, he may be the most brilliant coach in the world, but if the players aren't listening to him and doing what he asked, then you have to go get another voice in there. But again, I go back to the optics of having Chris Klein do that. Um, It's almost like just, you got to write the season off. If Klein is going to stay to the end, you can't make, I don't think you can make a managerial change because the optics are so bad. The, the supporters are not going to go along with that. It's going to become a thing where that coach is Klein's coach. And, and once again, it looks like Chris Klein is blaming the manager for, for the team's disarray. But if the team's not listening to Greg, I mean, I don't know what you do at that point. You, he becomes a lame duck. you got to keep him because Klein's above him. Right. But the team's not going to respond to him. It's really a bad situation. And we haven't even talked about, as much of a dumpster fire as the season has already been 10 games in, we haven't even talked about the supporters, another small crowd, another small, fairly quiet crowd. Yeah. Um, we can talk about that as well. I, I think blue ninja, um, said something said the results would cause any athlete to start doubting the coach too. Again, you're okay. I, I think it's okay to group the loss in with all the other losses, right? A loss is a loss. They're equal. All losses are equal, right? The whole deal. Um, but this is more of a Houston performance, Kevin, than it is a, you know, LAFC or Seattle performance, right? This was this was a Houston. And we looked at the Houston game and said, geez, that was a bad game. And you look at the Colorado game and go say, geez, that was a bad game. You look at the Dallas game. Geez, that was a bad game. I'm not saying they haven't had bad games, but group the losses into those more than anything else. There's one whole thing that I think is overlooked in all this. And yes, you can say adios to Greg Vanny um, and anybody can do it. Right, you can appoint you can you can appoint an interim coach. You can do all those things. Um, there has nobody who has bit made more progress in reorganizing the front office than Greg Vanny um, since the academy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, listen. I think I think Dennis Tocosa tried, and I think there were roadblocks to him trying to do all the stuff that he wanted to do. I think Vanny has been given the most leeway, most latitude to be able to make changes, and has made a lot of really positive changes in how the LA Galaxy performs. So if you decide that Greg Vanny is gone, then you're losing all of that as well, right? You're going to have to have somebody else who has to come in and figure out what that is and how to fix that and keep going. Because as we have talked about, and we talked about uh, American uh, uh, American soccer analysts or American analyst soccer now, I can't remember what the, what the website, we had it on Thursday. Um, they were talking about the analytics groups and where the LA Galaxy are, and the Galaxy are in the bottom of that. And I know having talked to Greg, that he has made progress in trying to turn that around in terms of getting an analytics department. The Galaxy's still behind on that, um, from my understanding. Uh, maybe don't have full-time people whose job it actually is to do those analytics in terms of scouting and all the things that they want to do. Michael Stevens, director of scouting, right? Do working on that stuff. Um, and, but there's, there's, they're lacking that. The bottom line is that we know that Siggy Schmidt hit roadblocks trying to revamp the front office. We know that Guillermo Verascolotos and Dennis DeClosa hit roadblocks when they were trying to revamp the front office. Vanny has had more success than any of them. So do you gut it out with Vanny knowing that he is putting together processes that should help the LA Galaxy down the road? There's been too many times the Galaxy have pulled the plug on projects and decided, oops, we were wrong. We need to do something else. And that means no progress since 2017. That's that's tough to swallow, especially if you've allowed Greg Vanny to do all the jobs. Listen, not hiring a general manager whenever Dennis DeClosa was fired is probably a mistake. We talked about that at the very, very beginning, which was there's a lot of guys in Major League Stro- Soccer who struggle to do every single job. Greg Vanny is being in charge of every single job. And now he has a dumpster fire on his hands of where he has to take care of the first team. Does he have time to look at the academy? Does he have time? To, he shouldn't have time. Because it should be all about the first team. So other things take problems. So, again, you can get rid of Greg Vanny, but he's the one who's had more success than anybody in the front office. And listen, people can argue, oh, well, the, the success hasn't shown on the field. Mm-hmm. 
Some people have said the LA Galaxy didn't have a very good transfer window. They brought in Tyler Boyd, who I like. They brought in Aude, who I like. They brought in Caligari, who I like. Now, did they get the winger? No. And that's where we sort of beat them up on it, right? Which is they didn't get the winger that they so badly needed. Now they have to try to do that internally inside of that summer transfer window and, and doing those things. And that's going to be expensive and difficult and all sorts of other things. Well, Greg Vanny has some help now with Will Coons. Again, arriving a little bit late. Um, Greg Vanny did have winning records his first two seasons, made the playoffs one year, should have made the playoffs the other year, except for that bad call and the penalty late in, in, in the other game, the Real Salt Lake game. Um, otherwise, Greg Vanny would have been in the playoffs twice. That would have been a good start. I think the Galaxy management came to the conclusion that the micromanaging wasn't working, that they brought in Greg Vanny. He was the guy. He was the, the guy that knew the culture that was with the Galaxy at the start. Just turn everything over to him. And I think they finally made that decision three years ago to give him much more space to operate than they gave to to his predecessors, Dennis and Siggy and everyone that came before him. Um, you know, and I, and I think you're right. I think that that has been successful. It, but it is too much for one guy to do because there's, it's not like in Toronto he came in and he set up the academy system and then became head coach. And he just sort of had to maintain that. This time he came in and everything was in disarray. And I think he had to he had to set up a scouting department. He had to set up an analytics department. He had to redo the academy. Uh, it was a lot. And, and I think you're right. I mean, I think at some point the Galaxy had to say, "Look, we need to we need some continuity. We need because they've had five managers now since Bruce left after the end of the 2016 season. So five managers in what six seasons? I, I think that they do have to provide for some continuity, and maybe they have to take their blows this year." to get to someplace better in a couple of years down the road. The problem is that it, it doesn't happen in soccer domestically or internationally. I, I saw a thing today where the average, the median term for a manager in, in MLS is like 602 days. So that's basically less than two seasons. That's the average term for a manager in, in MLS. And it's even less in European soccer. In baseball and football, we see teams go through five and six and seven losing seasons to rebuild. That doesn't happen in soccer, and, and maybe the Galaxy need to bite the bullet this season to allow Greg Vanny to set things up going forward, as painful as it is. Maybe that's one way to look at this, to say, you know, we're a mess. It's going to take time to clean up. It's not like the Galaxy haven't had successful managers come in and take over the Galaxy. Um, Siggy Schmidt was a, is a widely known manager in Major League Soccer, one of the top winningest managers, I think, in all of Major League Soccer. Second. He, second, second, right? Second yeah. yeah. Um, a guy who'd coached the Galaxy before and had some success. Um, there were lots of reasons that 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 the LA Galaxy have had very good managers that haven't been successful. So, you know, I, I even think Guillermo Barrascoleto, while I didn't think he is, his overall ideas were very complex, uh, maybe we went the other way with Vanny, which is, which is somewhat more complex. Um, but having said that, Greg Vanny has been successful in this league. Now, he was successful, I think, with a very good general manager um, in Baz Pachenko, right? And so those two worked well together to set up a long process in Toronto. I think that Toronto process took about five years um, to sort of really set up and be successful. Um, so those are the things. Again, I don't have the answers. It's it's very difficult because in this particular situation where you're at, where you have one win in 10 games, you have the worst start in their 28-year history the LA Galaxy have right now. Where is that breaking point? And then the befuddlement or or sort of the uh, the mixing in of all of the off-field stuff that have cost the LA Galaxy this year as well, with Klein being suspended, with the million-dollar uh, general allocation money fine, um, with the uh, no summer transfer window for internationals, with then moving Julian Araujo, with Sam Grancier not coming back. I mean, there are certainly some things in there that you could say aren't Vanny's fault. Um, but there are so there there are many things that you can say are Vanny's fault, and so when you mix those all together, this is the witch's brew that you have right now—a one-win LA Galaxy team that looked oh just pathetic on on Saturday night. There's no there's no saving it. I know ACB returned to the uh, to the stadium. Um, they were chanting, "We want better," um, you know that type of thing. Greg Vanny agreed with them. Chicharito agreed with them. You know the whole the whole deal. Um, it's just. It's not that that wasn't it against Colorado, wasn't it? Um, I, I, I think they're going to rebound again. I think they're going to have a, a couple good games in here, and that's going to sort of steady things a little bit. 
But I want to see how that actually turns around because we've been saying, oh, well, this is the turnaround. This was that was the game. LAFC, whenever they play and they just lost that, they were really a very good team and they were probably the better team and blah, 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 blah. blah. The whole deal, they're going to turn it around. I still see this team as incredibly talented. Um, if you just threw them on there, threw them on the field, Kevin, and told them to go out and play, I imagine that they would be successful sometimes, like 50 or 60 percent of the time without you doing anything. Well, you know, momentum is a strange thing. It goes both ways. People talk about we got to build momentum. Well, you can also have momentum go the other way. And the Galaxy, this slide seems to be turning into kind of a little bit of an avalanche. And, and it, I think that the thing is, if, if the team was just struggling on the field, that would be one thing. But, uh, you know, we mentioned dumpster fire a couple of times. You look how the team's playing on the field. You look at the injuries. You look at the fact that and there's just so many non-Galaxy things. I mean, the Galaxy were the premier franchise in American soccer for a number of years. Everything they touched turned to gold. Everything they did worked right. This year, um, Grant Sear doesn't come back. Now, I know that wasn't the Galaxy's fault. It was a personal thing, but still, he was a guy that they counted on. He decided not to come back. That's never happened before. The Galaxy get caught cheating. That's never happened before. Um, they can't sign the players they want in the offseason. They always get the players they wanted. Aaron Long was supposed to come to the Galaxy. He wound up going to LAFC. Um, you know, the team in the same city. He was coming to L.A. He just went to the other team. Um, just so many things seem to be snowballing that it, it just it, – it's hard to know which hole, you know, in the dike that you put your finger in because there's water coming through all of them. I, that's, it, it's, it's hard for me. And I, I'm reading some of the comments is like, this team just sucks. They don't actually, they're not a sucky team. Uh, there are plenty of talented players on this team. Jovalich, talented player. Chicharito, talented player. Tyler Boyd, talented player. Ricky Puj, probably the best central midfielder in all of major league soccer. Not really showing a lot out of that. He's still playing above a lot of people's heads. But Ricky Pouge, Gaston Brugman, very serviceable. A lot of teams would like to have them, right? Now, whoever plays that right wing, and again, that's the big problem. If Douglas Costa comes in, he's still a serviceable player if he can actually stay healthy. I'm starting to believe that's impossible. Um, so all the things. Look at Aude. From what I've seen, is a good player, right? Um, you have Kossaris, a, a World Cup veteran. Um, this guy... Four times. Four times. Yeah, four times over. World Cup veteran. Has played, I think, well in some cases. A little aggressive sometimes. Has to be. Jalen Neal, 19 years old, playing out of his dang skin in this particular uh, setup for the LA Galaxy. You have Caligari on the right-hand side. I think he's good. I don't think the LA Galaxy have a horrible team. They're missing width on the on the one wing. Well, what if you put Caligari up there? Oh, move him up and then put Leardam on the, on the backside? You can. Yeah. You can. I mean... It it, we're at the stage now where you got to get creative. You got to try something. I, I, I think Greg Vanny has basically told you to F right off whenever you say you got to get creative and you got to try something. He has been getting creative. He has been trying something. He's telling you, no, stop that. Uh, <laughs> my guess is it's either going to be, you know, a five, three, two, three, five, two. Um, but I think he's done with the two forward set. He, he, he sort of said that very clearly. I think that whenever that now open cup, and we'll talk about that game here in a second, Wednesday night, that's different because I don't know how they're going to approach that. And that's something we're, we'll, we'll discuss. But go back to the game on Mother's Day, which I'm not going to, because how in God's name is anybody going to, their wife is going to be like, yeah, you could just go to a soccer game on on that particular day, unless your wife likes soccer. Uh, or trains. Or tra ride trains. No, oh, no, I don't think there's any any train riding on, on Sunday either. Um, but, you know, whenever they play San Jose, guess what? San Jose, good team. Good team. The Galaxy are running into a buzzsaw with San Jose. How do they line up? There's going to be a single forward up top. Chicharito will be there. Jovalich will come in off the bench. Um, and they'll figure out a way to fill out that midfield somehow. Um, they always seem to uh, in terms of how they do it. But maybe putting wing backs on there. Um, maybe doing something that's that's a little bit different that they haven't done. Um, so anyway, those like a 5-4-1. Um, you know, and you can sort of figure out who's going to be your wide player. You put Tyler Boyd in there on one. You can sort of let Delgado swing out on the right-hand side. Um, let Caligari get up and around. Um, you know, there's, there's things you can do, uh, that they haven't done with sort of a more, I, I think what they think are going to be a more central or a more comfortable, um, setup. So, um, so how do you play the Seattle game? Because I, I can see the galaxy looking at this and saying, we need to stop the bleeding. We need, to, we need to feel good about ourselves. Let's go out and really try to win this game and use our first team, uh, because Seattle may not bring their, their best players They're They're on the road. They just lost to Kansas City. They were embarrassed by that. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe this is a chance for the Galaxy to sort of feel good about themselves. So on the other hand, if they run their best players out there, 
and, and Jordan Moore scores three goals and they lose, you've done more harm than good. It, it's, uh, I mean, how it, you sort of look at the season. This is a ch- this is a do over for the LA Galaxy, as far as I'm concerned, right? This is this is a way that you are able to um, start over. You haven't lost a game in Open Cup. You're live in Open Cup, right? So this is a if you're Greg Vanny, you're going in there. Listen, our record's 0 and 0 right now. We're playing against Seattle. Um, seeing how Seattle set up against their lower division team, which they went, which they won five to four, but it was five to four, um, a crazy game. There's likely to be rotation within Seattle. Um, and so if that rotation happens, the LA Galaxy could play a first team lineup and really go after the Open Cup. Uh, knowing that, again, you have a rivalry game at home on Sunday, but tough cookies sometimes. Everybody's going to wear, you know, everybody's going to play that two games. Uh, that's how it's going to go. You're going to put your A team out there because you have a chance against Seattle. Um, the other thing is that Vanny is understands that the Open Cup probably doesn't save his season. Um, and still puts more emphasis on the regular season. Um, in there, I, which way do you think Vanny goes? Do you think he throws it all on Wednesday night, thinking that Seattle's going to rotate in, um, or or do you think he's saving his his best guys and giving some guys some rests for for that game that's going to happen on Sunday? No, I think when you look at the fact that he sat Jalen Neal, if you're talking about squad rotation, that would indicate that Jalen Neal was in his mind to start against Seattle, and that might give you an indication then maybe he is going to start a lot of his first team players, the, the healthy ones in any case. Um, I don't know if the U.S. Open Cup would save a season, but if they make a deep run, at least that's something to hold on to. And, I, I you know, I, we've talked on the show a million times. I'm really a big believer in the psychological aspect of the game, and I do think that the Galaxy need to find something to feel good about. Um, and, and this could be it. Again, though, if you do that and you lose – then you're saying, oh God, we lost to Seattle's second best team. We suck even more than we thought we did. Yeah, but I mean, you know, just just reiteration that you already are sucking. I mean, you know, they all know how many wins are there. Again, a lot of the problems that I think the Galaxy face uh, get solved by winning and having some sort of consistency that sort of pops up. Uh, Vanny was optimistic with all the games they were playing at home in rapid succession that this would sort of, you know, key them in, in the right direction. But you lost against Colorado. You shouldn't have lost against Colorado. Um, that was a team that was struggling as well, and you walked right in there and just handed them the keys to the door but, but, and told them to take everything. Know, I, I would take issue with Vanny a little bit. Not, I mean, he's the he's won a lot more titles than I have as a coach, by the way. Um, uh, but I would say one thing is, is this may be a time when it's almost better to be on the road because you don't have your supporters in the stands. You're playing for uh, small crowds. I mean, large crowds for MLS, but certainly small crowds for the Galaxy. Uh, there's a lot of uneasiness among the fan base. This might be a time where you want to go on the road and win a few games and come back with a little momentum and have the fans behind you. I understand what he's saying about, you know, you're sleeping in your own bed and you're used to the locker room and the field and everything else, but it's not like the Galaxy are getting a ton of support uh, from the stands these days. I was, I was just going through and looking at some of Seattle's uh, starting lineups whenever they actually played in, in some of these games. I was looking at the their, their lineup. They just lost to Kansas City. Um, this game at home, by the way, um, and Kansas City was able to come out with a win. That was uh, a big deal. Peter Vermees says that's a start, but obviously it's not where we want to be. Uh, that game may have saved Peter Vermees' job for a little bit. Uh, by the way, their fans are boycotting as well, um, just in case you want to know. Two in the Western Conference, both having boycotts uh, right now. New York Red Bulls, by the way, were basically at that point um, to start boycotting uh, in the stands. Um, so there's that one. And then they went and played... Um, Seattle against San Diego in the Open Cup, and I sort of wanted to see what the lineup was for that. Uh, Freddie Montero started up top, so a lot of really big rotation for them for Seattle. Basically, a second starting eleven in a lot of way. Uh, Leo Chu is in there as a as a as a starter um, in this particular case as well. Um, so you know you sort of have to worry about him. But Freddie Montero, a uh, longtime Seattle Sounder, um, you would expect that he could do some damage on some things. Uh, just looking at Seattle's record as they come into this, um, Seattle basically had lost twice uh, the whole time. They lost once to uh, to Portland uh, in a four one game. Excuse me, they lost once uh, to Cincinnati in a one nothing game. They lost once to Portland in a four one game, um, and then they just lost to Sporting Kansas City. Uh, after tying um, at RSL. So they're a team that is certainly better than the LA Galaxy. The standings prove that out and everything else. Um, but how they go about it, Seattle currently the you know the top in the Western Conference with 20 points and 1.82 points per game. Uh, well, and when you look at who they lost to, they, they lost to teams that they... It, you could make the argument that perhaps they overlooked teams that are playing very poorly. Um, and that might be, again, another 
good thing for the galaxy. Certainly, Seattle's coming down here and, and knowing they're not facing the, the galaxy of old, you know, this may be a game that they think that they can win without trying, and, and that could play into the galaxy's favor as well. Hmm. Uh, anyway, five dollars. I'm just, I'm just sort of in thought. I'm, I don't know. I would love to be able to tell you I see a clear path ahead for the LA Galaxy. I don't, um, and I think something has to happen, and something needs to be shake, shaken up. I think something, somebody gets fired, um, because that's usually what happens in these situations, especially whenever you're there. Who gets fired? Who gets fired is certainly the most telling thing. That's, that's what I'm waiting to see. Supporters. Well, and that's where the supporters are right with this whole boycott thing, I think, because when you look over the last six seasons, which, you know, we we, we agree have been, for the most part, pretty poor, um, they've gone through five coaches. They've gone through three general managers. Two guys are still there, Klein and Karofsky. At some point, I'm not saying that it's their fault, but it, I'm just saying the evidence seems to suggest you've changed every other part in the car, and the car still isn't running right. Maybe the parts that, that haven't been changed yet are the ones that you should zero in on. 7.30 kickoff time, or right around 7.30 kickoff time for the Open Cup game coming up on Wednesday, May 10th. Uh, I should be there at that game, so I'll be able to watch what happens in said U.S. Open Cup. Uh, should be Where pretty can we watch it? Uh, what, it's on CBS, Gola So It's on... Uh, where else was it? Uh, Paramount Plus uh, streaming. There's a bunch of places that you can sort of watch that game. Um, people were telling me that none of them were available on Spectrum, so if you're looking for that, you're probably going to have to go streaming on that. Um, but we'll tweet out all the stuff. Uh, by the way, Andrew gave us a five dollar super chat. Andrew, thank you. I would have done this for free. You should have just. Uh, you probably already said it, but uh, and I missed it. But I appreciate the five dollar super chat. Uh, Andrew, uh, head of the LA Riot Squad, uh, he says, "Galaxy fans want your voice heard amongst other Galaxy fans. Please join the open forum on Friday, five twelve seven p.m. Check the socials. So um, at LA Riot Squad, I think out uh, G- Ghost Galaxy Outlaws." All the get all the ones I can never remember everybody's names now. Um, I'm starting to get old, I think, and I've just sort of grouped everybody together, which is not okay. Um, I wonder but, if there'll be pupusas on Wednesday. No, no, you not on an open pupusas. cup game. Not an open okay. cup game. No. So I, you don't. Ha- are you coming on Wednesday? Are you going to show up? If there's no pupusas, what's the point? <laughs> At this point, I sort of get you. By the um, way, you know our newspaper won two Pulitzers today, but neither one was for soccer writing. No. So you, you got you got shut out again. How dare they? Yeah. Um, I was sitting by the phone all day waiting, and then I saw that they handed handed them all out, and I didn't get one. Oh Damn. man, they were just—they called you into a meeting, and you thought that was it, but instead they just changed your your Gmail password, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. They did. They did change that, which okay. I think may explain the technical difficulties today. Yeah, uh, it certainly was. That's what I'm going with, anyways. That's what it was. Um, I mean, is is there any prediction for which way this goes, Kevin? Or the gal- do the Galaxy start winning games? I I tend to be. I know I'm overly optimistic sometimes, but I just look at this team. I know the people. I, I know the players. I talk to them on a regular basis. They're not a bad team, but it, it, it's hard for me to argue that right now. If anybody asks me about the LA Galaxy, I sort of just look at them and shake my head and be like, "No, they suck." I mean, it's it's horrible. Um, you know, I can't believe, again, I can't believe I took a shower, got dressed, drove up the freeway for 35 minutes to watch that crap. Um, because well, that's, it, that game was not a good game. It, you're right. I mean, individually, this is a very talented team. They have some really outstanding players, but I, I do wonder about what things are going on internally. And I think you, you know, you go to the, back to the Caceres and, and, and Costa meltdown on the road in that one game where they both got red cards for stupid fouls. You go back to Jovalich trying to walk to the locker room after he got taken out of the game. Chicharito's comments over the weekend about other people not being accountable. It just is starting to add up to me that certainly this team is is underperforming by a huge amount. There has to be a reason for that. And I'm just wondering if the I, – I, I don't know. I'm not in the locker room. But there isn't a, 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 a Sasha in there. There isn't a Victor Vasquez to sort of hold players to account. And it, it that, that's all I can think of because this team is too good to be playing this poorly. Hmm. All right. I guess that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I, I don't know. I would love to be able to guide people on this. Um, I, I don't, it, it, when the coach and the players can't really give me good answers, like in terms of telling me the direction that they think, again, I think Greg has a direction he's going. Um, I think they're going back to a single striker up top. Definitely think that's happening. Um, so 
you know, knowing that and knowing that that's coming to, to fruition, maybe that fixes some things. Maybe the galaxy calmed themselves down a little bit. Maybe the roles are more defined in that, you know, four, two, three, one. Um, maybe that helps them better, you know. You know what? And maybe the Open Cup is is the turning point. And I'm trying to, again, be optimistic here, but it's a game that I think is probably going to draw a pretty small crowd. It's not a national TV. It's on the streaming service. Uh, it, it it could be one of those games where Greg Vanny just rolls the ball out and says, guys, go have some fun. Go play like, like, like you mentioned earlier, go play like you're in a park. Just go have some fun. Maybe they go out and do that and they just get all that weight off their shoulders. They just have a good time playing soccer again. Um, you know, like, back, you know, like back in the day when they were little kids playing in the park, maybe they just go out and play like that and all that weight comes off and they have a really good game and they feel good about themselves. Maybe that happens. They need to or be, maybe not. They need to be like a goldfish. Need to be like a goldfish. <laughs> That's, a, that's the answer. All right. Uh, I think that'll about do it for us tonight. LA Galaxy playing Seattle Sounders on Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Uh, that's where you can uh, find that game. Should The kickoff should happen fairly close to 7.30. They don't give us usually kickoff times right away for uh, for U.S. Open Cup games, but it says 7.30 on it. It should be pretty close. 7.35, 7.37, that type of thing is it would be my guess uh, for those starts. It could even kick off like right at 7.30, so maybe don't be late to this game if you can avoid it uh, and if you're headed up there for the game. So uh, that's what's going on. Anything else, Kevin? You good? No, we, we need to be a goldfish about this podcast, yeah, I think. <laughs> throw it away, start over again. All right. Uh, if you're looking for Mr. Kevin Baxter on Twitter, it's at KBaxter11. And please head on over to uh, LATimes.com where you can find all of Kevin uh, Baxter's non-Pulitzer Prize winning uh, stories. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, if you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at JGESMAN, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N, and, of course, at Galaxy Podcast and still working on fixing corner of the galaxy website we'll get that up and going here in just a little bit all right hopefully if you're headed to the game we'll see you there if not watch it on tv watch it on streaming however you're doing it you'll get to watch it and we'll of course be back here on thursday to get you ready for the weekend and to recap that game for mr kevin the panda baxter i'm josh pato guess when you've been listening you've been watching to corner of the galaxy from the box on corner of the galaxy.com have a great one everybody you've been listening to the corner of the galaxy podcast on corner of the galaxy.com you can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.